Hi and welcome to this session about building devices that can run for years on small batteries. My name is Ivan Holt. I am a software engineer and I work in the field of healthcare systems. For the last few years I have been building different types of IoT prototypes at my local makerspace. I have published a few guides over at Element 14 and Hackster and today we will look at one of these projects. You can find more details about the project over at Element 14. Search my, for my name Ivan Holt and you will find a quite comprehensive write-up. You can also find the source code for the project at GitHub the username is I've Holt. Uh, this session will go through a demo and an overview of the project. I will have a quick run through of the service stack and how messaging works before we have a look at the device hardware. Then I will uh, run through some battery options and considerations before we look at some measurement techniques. Then we will run through some of the code for the device before I end with some lessons that I have learned during this project. The project came alive because our mailbox is positioned a bit uh, ways from our house. And uh, these days we don't receive spam mail much of uh, communication is digital, so we might receive letters a few times uh, a week. Having to walk back to the street and to check the mailbox is the reason that I started this project. It was started about two years ago and it has been running on the same AAA batteries since then. The uh, requirements for the project was that I wanted a notification on my phone when a uh, mail was received. The mailbox itself is out of Wi-Fi range, so I needed more uh, range. I didn't want to have to change batteries often, and I wanted some kind of safeguard in case the device died or something got disconnected. If I had, hadn't heard from it for a few days, I wanted to have a notification. For a project like this, the choice of sensor is crucial and you will probably have to make some type of compromise and you have to decide what is more important. I chose reliability in this project and of course battery life. I did consider quite a few different physical phenomena to measure to send the notifications and I discovered that infrared would not make for a long uh, battery life. Also it would be hard to sense whole space of the mailbox. Most of the same um, things went for ultrasonic uh, sensor and I also realized that I probably would have to have several uh, ultrasonic sensors to be able to cover the whole space. Small partial pickup notes were hard to detect. They are really thin, light and small and they tend to stick to the sides of the box. That leads me to the next choice. I tried to make a kind of weight measurement, but I quickly uh, discovered that this was really hard to make reliable and um, it would not sense the small pickup notes. And I assumed that it would probably get uh, misaligned or stuck over time. Camera would have been really nice, so you could actually see what was inside the box, but um, this would not work well with uh, low energy solution, and it would also not work well with uh, low energy networks because of the data size to transmit. I was left with either using a read switch or tilt switch, as some call it, or a micro switch. The read switch seemed like a good option. I could put it in the lid 
and it would trigger when the lid was tilted. But being able to mount it in the correct position turned out to be a bit of a problem. And I decided to test out a micro switch. It is a very simple solution. Some think it is too simple, but uh, it was easy to mount. It is reliable. It has been working for a few years and uh, I'm happy with, uh, with this solution. I had decided not to mount the electronics on the inside of the mailbox as not to compromise the space. I used a outdoors electrical junction box to protect the electronics from the weather. It worked really well, but after placing it outdoors for the first time, I became a bit nervous of what would uh, be waiting for me when I came home. Especially after listening to Ben Ward out of the Oxford Flood Network describe his experiences with placing anonymous looking uh, boxes with wires sticking out of them in public or semi-public places. So I went to my local makerspace and uh, borrowed a vinyl cutter and made some semi-professional looking decals. I have mo uh, modeled and 3D printed a custom enclosure and the next steps will be to make a resin casting out of this. Next we will have a very brief look at the service stack. I have defined a pretty standard The Things Network application and this will route messages to a platform called All Things Talk. The Things Network application in this project receives messages from the device containing the battery voltage. The battery voltage has been split into two bytes and I have had to define a decoder that puts these two bytes together as an integer. The integration makes sure that the messages get passed along to All Things Talk. And in All Things Talk, I can define rules. One rule will make sure that notifications are sent to my mobile phone and email whenever the lid is opened. Another rule will uh, give the same type of notification if nothing has happened for the past four days. Next we will look at some very important hardware considerations. To be able to achieve long battery life, the device will have to be in deep sleep mode for as much as possible. Therefore, I had to choose a LoRaWAN development board that had the lowest possible current consumption during deep sleep. Also, it would have to have the capability of defining the type of interrupts that would wake it from deep sleep when needed. Finally, a current consumption during transmission would have to be at the lowest possible uh, level. I have tried a few different development boards. These are my recommendations. Uh, Rocket Scream makes a few different types and some of you may recognize the low power library uh, which is written by the uh, maker of these boards. Lara Core has a bit of a more modern approach. This board is also much smaller. I chose a board from Weissen, uh, which at the time, a few years ago, uh, seemed like the best uh, solution. Uh, the author also has uh, made quite a few good uh, tutorials regarding low power consumption and also the use of coin cells. The next part was crucial to get right. The development board spends most of its time in deep sleep mode conserving energy. Only a few pins are capable of being defined as interrupts to wake 
the development board from this mode. The uh, micro switch has two configurations and I used uh, the one called normally closed. This means that normally the microcontroller will be sleeping and the lid will be closed. This leads to the micro switch being depressed and the switch circuit will be open that is not completed. When the lid is opened the switch is released and this will complete the circuit and this will lead to a rising edge on the pin that is used. Following this <clears throat> the pin will be in high state and still nothing is happening. The microcontroller is still in sleep mode. But when the mail is deposited and the lid is closed, the pin with the micro switch will enter falling edge and this triggers an interrupt. This leads to the microcontroller waking, measuring the battery, sending a radio signal, registering a new interrupt and going to sleep. The choice of a battery is very important for a project like this. LiPo batteries have become quite popular in recent years. They have a very high energy density. They often come with convenient connectors that fit many modern development boards. And they have a predictable flat voltage curve. And they are rechargeable. These types of batteries are suited for projects with high uh, current demand, like driving motors and such. But because of a high self-discharge uh, rate, maybe as high as 5% a month, does not make it suitable for a low energy sensor. Because of restrictions on uh, transportation with the planes, they are quite expensive and as I have experienced myself they are quite dangerous. High quality alkaline batteries are a good option as they have a low self discharge rate and because of availability the price is quite low. You will however need an efficient regulator to make the highest use of them. The LS14500 types of batteries are another interesting option. Compared to alkaline batteries of the same size, they have quite a high energy density and the nominal voltage of 3.6 volts and a flat voltage curve makes them an interesting choice for 3 volt circuits. They have a low self discharge rate, which is also useful. They are, however, a bit expensive. Lithium coin cell batteries are very cheap and they can last for a long time. Using them for IoT projects can be a bit of a challenge as continuous discharge will damage them and you have to rely on pulse discharging. The most important part of this session is about measurement techniques. Without being able to measure, it's all guesswork. I started attempting to measure current consumption two years ago by using a rather expensive Fluke multimeter and using the ammeter function. And I was quickly disappointed, realizing that uh, below a milliampere, it was quite unreliable. Next I got hold of a more suitable multimeter, but still it was not uh, suitable for even lower values. And it was not until I got hold of a, a microcurrent gold that I was able to consistently measure microamperes. The problem though was that the program code of the microcontroller moves between different phases from sleeping to waking up taking measurements, starting up components, transmitting messages, and so on. 
and being able to display these using a uh, multimeter is quite difficult and you end up having to put in a lot of delays or similar techniques. Next I wanted to try to use an oscilloscope to display the current consumption on a timeline. So I used a non-switching lab power supply, I used the microcurrent and I used the oscilloscope's serial decode feature so that I could display debug strings on the timeline. This might have worked. Dave Jones has stated that the microcurrent is not suitable for oscilloscopes and I soon discovered why. Uh, firstly, it was picking up a lot of noise and it was very hard to see what was um, the actual value and what was just noise. And um, we, I tried to bypass the development board's switching regulator and that helped a lot, but still there was a lot of noise. Uh, the other practical problem was that the way the my oscilloscope displays serial decode on the timeline, you are uh, limited to how far you can zoom out on the timeline and it was just not practical. I have uh, received a tip that maybe I could have used one of the GPIOs to trigger the oscilloscope instead, but it is still not a perfect solution and it is a lot of uh, setup. So when you switch back and forth from improving the code to measuring and back and forth, it is a lot of hassle. Luckily, a company called Koitech had just released a device called the OT Arc. I still believe that an oscilloscope and a reliable lab power supply and a good multimeter are essential tools for working with this kind of thing. I think a demonstration will speak for itself how convenient this device is. The OT Arc will act as a power supply and I have replaced the battery connectors on the development board with the battery terminals with the power terminals on the OT Arc. We will start with the same voltage as the batteries combined and I have also connected a serial output from the device. And before we start the um, device, I will just clear uh, the TTN console so we can see the transmission. We start a new recording and we enable the power supply. And the, the upper part of the screen is the uh, current consumption. The middle part is uh, the voltage that will become quite useful uh, later. And in the bottom part we can see the serial output. And these are my uh, debug statements in my code. So I will just trigger the device. And it will uh, send a message and go back to sleep. And um, I will pause uh, or stop the recording now and switch off the power supply. We can go to check the console and uh, we find that the device joined and it sent two messages. Now we can return and we can have a, a look at what uh, went on here. Firstly, my code has a little delay uh, when it starts to make a debugging convenient. 
uh, we can uh, select one of the debug statements and it will highlight in the timeline where we are and this is extremely valuable and uh, makes for a re really efficient workflow when investigating uh, the code and making optimizations and verifying the results. We can also um, select several uh, debug statements. So I will uh, I'll just uh, firstly describe what is going on here. Uh, the device uh, runs its setup and it makes one transmission and <coughs> this transmission uh, also makes sure that we join the uh, network so that would account for these two first uh, um, statements in the TTN uh, log Our uh, voltage is uh, measured and uh, displayed and uh, we can see that the radio has joined the network, the transmission completes. Then the device goes into something I've called Grace Sleep and this is an intermediary phase before it completely powers down and uh, this is something I implemented because just in case someone would open and close the, the lid of the mailbox uh, several times or there was some kind of vibration or something like that so in the grace period that would account for for this period the uh, device is sleeping for eight seconds so we can see what kind of current consumption is going on in this period. That is about 13 micro amperes, which is pretty good. And in this phase, the device is not responsive at all. So opening and closing the lid will not wake the device. When this um, grace sleep period ends the device enters proper power down or deep sleep this is where we achieve the lo lowest uh, current consumption and uh, this is about eight or nine uh, microamps that is pretty good Now the device will sleep until the uh, micro switch is activated or it hits a falling edge. This is what I triggered in this part of the graph. We hit a, a statement that says power up. The uh, device will measure batteries and uh, send a message so we can see the different parts uh, here the entire sequence is this uh, this part we are seeing the, the the average and you can obviously see a uh, spike this part only happens maybe twice a day and uh, often uh, not every day uh, so this is uh, pretty good and uh, when the transmission is complete we again enter a gray sleep where the device is sleeping for eight seconds and in a, it is not listening for inter interrupts when that is complete it again powers down and uh, as much as possible and uh, we have a pretty low uh, current consumption 
So my basic workflow is to write some code, profile, and try to find problem areas, do code iterations, and do another profile, and uh, see if I fix the problem, and so on. Uh, and this is really uh, efficient way to work. There are so many things that you can do with uh, this uh, with the OT arc, and um, I will only show a few more things. The power regulator is very important when you're especially using alkaline batteries, as I am. Let's have a look at what happens if I simulate that the the batteries have uh, dropped in voltage meaning they are running out of juice we will start another recording and compare sometimes it's hard to uh, synchronize the graphs when you're uh, clicking but you can um, adjust the uh, start time uh, later so you can try to sync them up now the device has uh, joined and sent a message and it is sleeping and uh, I will see if I can trigger uh, transmission just about at the same time as last. Okay, it has um, transmitted and uh, it is entering power down or deep sleep. So I will disconnect the power source and stop the recording. We can evidently see that the power source or the, the voltage was uh, much lower in this uh, example. We can also see some evidence that uh, switching power regulator is uh, working much harder in this case. And uh, when we look at the current consumption, it is much uh, higher. We can uh, just select one area now it did complete the transmission and join a bit later uh, in this second uh, run so I'll try to find an area where um, the graphs are already synced or else I would have to adjust them and um, we can see the debug outputs from both of our uh, runs at this point we are in sleep and in the the first run I remember that we were about eight and a half microamps in the case where the batteries have dropped in voltage the consumption is much higher the regulator has to work much harder to supply this is also very um, useful I will demonstrate one more thing I talked about using coin cell batteries. I'll use an uh, additional feature which is called the battery toolbox, uh, which can do a few things, uh, including emulating batteries. So I will uh, select one type of battery that has been defined. I will uh, not track uh, the used uh, capacity of the battery. I will just have a look at the voltage uh, drop. So we again we start a new recording. We activate the power supply. Now we will see drops in voltage. I have 
done this with a with an actual coin cell battery of this type it didn't look exactly the same it, it used a much more time to uh, regain um, the voltage but the important thing <coughs> to to notice here is that the device is just running and resetting and running and resetting it, it can't complete its cycle because the voltage drops too low so I will stop this recording now we can um, basically have a look at where our problem uh, starts no surprise the voltage drops happen where our transmissions happen where we have a high spike. So to use coin cell batteries you have to do a kind of different approach where you might have to make some kind of a buffer with a capacitor or something like that. Your code also needs to try to respect pulsing so that uh, you, do, you don't make the, the device do its work as quickly as possible. You might have to insert pauses to let the battery uh, regain its uh, voltage. I usually program my uh, board using the FTDI interface and I would have liked to see a possibility to program the board through the OTARC or some other method so that I wouldn't have to connect and disconnect uh, when switching between doing code iterations, programming the board and power optimizations. Maybe it's possible to do this, I don't know. My dad is a experienced ham radio operator and uh, he has shown me quite a few valuable tricks. I noticed that some of my LoRa antennas were performing differently and after some uh, reading on the uh, TTN forums I saw reports of dodgy antennas being sold with uh, LoRa devices and in some cases plain wrong uh, antennas uh, bundled, for instance Wi-Fi antennas. The proper way to measure if your antenna is appropriate would be to use a spectrum analyzer. These are quite expensive and you also need some extra equipment to be able to measure antennas properly. One budget solution is to buy one of the many popular vector network analyzers. I advise you to spend some time reading about them. And, um, there is apparently some drama going on uh, regarding open hardware design and um, missing royalties and, and whatnot. You should also make sure that you buy one that completely covers the frequency that is uh, in your area of the world. So in my case it is 868 megahertz. And um, I bought a vector network analyzer that goes up to 1 gigahertz. I have used this on my gateway antennas also and it is a cheap way to remove some uncertainty. In the TTN console you can see some characteristics about your radio transmissions. I wanted further ways to investigate this and maybe visualize it. That's uh, how I started uh, the path down into software-defined radio. After some experimentation I ended up with an AirSpy R2 and uh, a preamplifier that was suitable for the uh, frequency that we use in my part of the world. And uh, I used a, um, an antenna that is usually used for, for gateways. You will find some uh, insight into how LoRa transmissions uh, work and some um, attempts at reverse engineering. But um, you shouldn't expect to be able to read the encrypted payload in a LoRa 1 transmission. 
but there are some things that you can uh, have a look at and uh, with my setup I have been able to visualize and see my device transmissions you would be able to get a feeling of uh, the transmission strength or at least if it changes dramatically for instance by changing to a dodgy antenna you can measure the uh, the bandwidth this can uh, help you investigate maybe that ADR is not uh, working as you expect you can measure airtime which is really useful and this will be for the complete transmission you can uh, visualize if your device is listening for downlinks when that is not intentional now we will have a look at the code for the device i use arduino environment and some popular libraries if you want to look at further details you can always visit the project description at element 14 and you will find the source code at github to have a look at the highlights in our setup code we defined the pin that the micro switch is connected to as an in input with a pull-up resistor and this cannot be any old pin it has to be one that is interrupt enabled and you'll have to look up the datasheet to find this we disable non-essentials in this case this is the flash memory that we don't uh, need to access i've used the library to power this down further we perform uh, LoRa one initiation and we start joining the network by sending a message the message consists of an array with two bytes we have a function that retrieves the battery voltage and we split this value into two bytes we have to redefine the transmission power if we want to override it every time the radio module uh, wakes up from sleep and this is the part where we queue our transmission we are not interested in receiving confirmation of a received message hopefully this will result in an event that is called uh, transmission complete if we look at OTARC in the code we have passed a uh, setup we have sent the transmission we have read the voltage we have joined and now we hopefully have received a transmission complete event so this completes the uh, joining and this uh, first sending next i want to uh, define a grace period where i'm not interested in looking at uh, what the, the micro switch is doing i just want it to conserve energy and i perform a sleep on the radio module and i use the low power library to power down the microcontroller for eight seconds you will see some places that when I uh, perform a print line on the serial I follow with the serial flush and this is because when I power down the MCU this can sometimes cut the serial uh, communication short so this flush just makes sure that uh, the serial uh, line has uh, completed after eight seconds we continue with a complete power down or a deep sleep and in uh, our measurement we are at this point so this is eight seconds the power down is uh, quite similar to the gray sleep except that we attach an interrupt to an interrupt capable pin 
and we defined a function that will be called uh, if this uh, interrupt triggers and we define that the mode is a falling edge. When we have defined this interrupt, we make the uh, MCU sleep forever. This is uh, this part of the code. And so the um, device will live in this state for most of its lifetime. So when the lid uh, triggers the switch, this method is called it does nothing and it shouldn't do a lot of uh, work. It can set some states or something that you can read later, but it shouldn't hold up uh, the uh, microcontroller because if you have several interrupts registered, if this is uh, running some uh, long running code, it will not notice the other interrupts. When the uh, interrupt is triggered, that me a method or function has been uh, called the MCU will continue down this code block. It has powered up and we want to clean up a few things. So we detach the interrupt and then we continue. We automatically time a new transmission the uh, radio will send this when it is available. When it is available, our do send method will be called again and the loop will continue. Finally, I will run through some lessons that I have learned while making this project. Firstly, the devil is in the details, meaning that if you want something to run for years on batteries, everything has to be deliberate and small mistakes can ruin the whole project. Source control everything. I usually make a private repository where I work on my project and when I want to share it, I make a new repository. For instance, at GitHub, I make sure not to share my private keys and such. I also usually keep 3D models and configuration files and documentation, uh, data sheets and, and stuff that you usually don't associate with source control. And this is useful even if you are a single developer. Uh, it is always uh, nice and it can be a lifesaver to be able to go back some versions. Build mockups of where your sensor is supposed to be placed. I built a simple replica of my mailbox using foam core and it saved me a lot of hassle. If you plan to design a custom enclosure, I advise you to model the el electronic first. It doesn't have to be a detailed model, but something that will save you some trial and error so that you know the dimensions of the electronics. Then you can build your enclosure around this. Most boards come with some status LEDs and if you are plan to make a device that will live for years, you don't need these LEDs. In some cases you will have to desolder the whole LED. I wish that I had saved some reference batteries when I deployed this uh, sensor in the beginning. That way I could uh, compare what natural self-discharge has meant compared to uh, the device being powered and used. I started using some no-brand batteries and they died due to freezing temperatures the first night. So buy some proper quality batteries. Document your project. If that means writing something down in a book or writing a guide that you publish and share with others, it is really helpful to be able to go back and look at the decisions you made and why you made them. An oscilloscope with serial decode capability is really useful. More and more sensors are uh, digital and they communicate over on a bus type or the other. And being able to read them raw without going through a microcontroller is really useful. 
Thank you for following this session. I hope there has been something useful for you and happy hacking.